As the experience and insights gained in the past 18 months by applying the framework in various Qatar client engagements, Dr. Gatt will put special emphasis on critical success factors for making the technical debt initiative work for you, your company, its partners, and its customers. Dr. Israel Gadd is Director of Qatar Consortium's Agile Product and Project Management Practice. He is recognized as the architect of the Agile transformation at BMC Software, where under his leadership, Scrum users increased from zero to 1,000, resulting in nearly three times faster time to market than industry average and 20 to 50% improvement in team productivity. Dr. Gatt's executive career spans top technology companies, including IBM, Microsoft, Digital, and EMC. He has led the development of products such as BMC Performance Manager and Microsoft Operations Manager, enabling the two companies to move toward next generation system management technology. Dr. Gatt is also well versed in growing smaller companies and held advisory and venture capital positions for companies in new high growth markets. In addition to publishing with Cutter in the IEEE, he posts frequently at the Agile Executive and tweets as Agile underscore exec. Welcome, Israel. Thanks for the kind words, Mark, and thanks everyone in the audience for joining us for what I would expect to be not only a presentation by me, but a lively interactive session on the topic of technical debt. In modern medicine, we hold the tenet that you need to do both prevention and treatment in order to handle a plague. If you do just one of those, you do not break the chain of transmission and the plague continues to rage and you need to deal with its effects on an ongoing basis. The overarching message in today's webinar is quite similar. You can, of course, do a little bit of technical debt work here and a little, debt, a little bit of technical debt work there. But in order to really rein it in, you have got to address it in multiple ways. Specifically, the Cutter Technical Debt Framework covers six aspects of technical debt work starting at the bottom with technical practices and going all the way to portfolio governance. Before we get in detail into the framework, let's spend a few minutes on technical debt and viewing it in the broader context of the software process. To start it with, what is technical debt? The term was coined years ago, ago by Ward Cunningham, and it describes something that I think everyone in the audience, myself included, knows for first hand from our experience. There are certain things that I would like to do in my code. For one reason or another, I'm not able to do them right now and I plan to do them at, an, at a later point in time. For example, assume we ran through six agile iterations. We are just now completing one hardening iteration, and we plan to do another hardening iteration. For good and valid marketing reasons and for getting feedback back into the development team, we decide to skip the, certain, the second hardening iteration and to go straight into the market after just one hardening iteration. Now, we definitely plan, once the product shipped, to go back and do the second hardening iteration. But at this point in time, we have a depth of one iteration and the equivalent monetary value could be $5,000 or $10,000 or whatever the figure is, depending on the team size, on the cost structure. But until we pay back the debt by way of doing the work we intended to do and did not actually carry out, we are in debt to the 
extent of one iteration and whatever the monetary equivalent is. Now, we of course plan to really pay back the debt, but the nature of uh, the programming work and the pressures in the market is such that all too often we do not find the time to do the second hardening iteration. Moreover, in the next release, we do some other shortcuts the way we did in this release. So little by little, the technical depth accumulates. And at a certain point in time, it starts being very, very clear that the software that we have is suffering from quality problems. We will be characterizing the quality issues in the code by way of technical depth and share with you which components we typically use and how we look at the overall technical depth. But before I get into that, I would like to make one point crystal clear. Technical depth is about doing the system right, what we call intrinsic quality. It is not about doing the right system, which we usually call extrinsic quality. In other words, technical debt or low level of technical debt is a criterion for success, a necessary one, but it's not sufficient. You might be doing wonderfully on technical debt and still fail in the market if you are not in touch with the customer, the requirements, the changes, etc. Conversely, you might be able to very well cater to the needs of your customers by way of providing them rich functionality. But if your technical debt is high, the quality issues will get you. For example, the system will collapse every so often in the hands of your customers. So we have a necessary condition and a sufficient condition. And the technical debt is all about doing the system right. In various cutter engagements, we typically see five major scenes. We see code with excessive level of complexity. We see code with a lot of duplication, for example, with device driver, where it's quite clear that somebody picked a block of code from one place and hurriedly put it in another place and did not have the time to really fit it to what it needs to do. We see a lot of rule violations, for example, lack of braces in a Java if statement. We see lack of test coverage, which means basically that we are flying uh, without a safety net. Namely, things can happen because we have not gone through the various branches in the code in terms of testing them. And we often see lack of good documentation on publicly exposed APIs. I would say most of the times those are the big five that we run into, and if you are able to address them, you probably will be in a very good shape. To give you an example, here is an engagement that colleague Chris Sterling and myself have done about, uh, oh, I would say, two years ago. We looked at 200 lines of code, and we figured half a million level of depth. The breakdown of the depth is depicted in this pie chart. As you can see, test coverage, the red section of the pie, is something like 60% of the depth. So it probably amounted to $300,000 or the like. If you move on to the next one here, complexity. Complexity obviously was something like 10 or 12 percent of the overall debt. So for the circumstances of this client, 
the big thing was to catch up on test coverage and not necessarily start immediately with complexity or with rule violations. It would not hurt, but the big thing was lack of test coverage. Here is another example, courtesy again of my colleague Chris Sterling, which gives you a typical picture of a project dashboard that we will provide you as part of an engagement. In this particular case, we are talking about 162,000 lines of code. And we are talking about technical debt at the amount of $34,100,000. So we have a situation where the level of technical debt, all in all, is about $2 per line of code. And we zero in on various components of the technical debt. For example, if you take a look at complexity, you have a histogram of methods per level of complexity. If you take a look at uh, the first bar here, we have something like, I don't know, 7,000 or 8,000 methods with complexity of one. On the other hand, we have some amount of methods with complexity per method of 12. And obviously, those would be one that we would focus on and start fixing. If you take a look at the left, at the levels of complexity per class being 30.9 and per file being 42.2, those are general warning signs. Namely, this is a higher level of complexity than we would like to see. And in a few minutes, I will tie it into error proneness of various classes and modules. If we move on to the business of duplication of code, uh, you see it flagged here being 7.1%. And this is usually an unsatisfactory state of affairs. So we actually uh, have this bar here as an alert to point out to the programming team that this is something that you need to worry about. And if you take a look at rule violations, while there are a lot of rules that are not in compliance, the important thing is we have zero one on blockers and zero one on critical uh, rule violations. So the picture uh, leaves something to be desired, but it's not uh, requiring early action. Now, here we are with this kind of uh, dashboard at our disposal. And the question really that this seminar addresses is what do we do with this kind of data? In order to get into this question, we will step back for a minute and look at technical debt in the overall context of the software process. What you see in this slide is the cutter view of the software process. You have the process as a first gear and this uh, could be Kanban, or could be Scrum, or could be Crystal, or could be APM, or whatever method you use to produce the software. We, of course, look at proficiency of the software. So, for example, we may look at how well we are doing retrospectives, or how well we are doing release planning, etc. However, this to itself is not sufficient because I might be doing retrospectives better than anyone else in the world, but it does not amount to much if my output, namely the code, is not of high quality. So we look at the process in the context of the quality of the code we produce. And this is an extremely data point, a data point of extreme importance because it can easily guide the 
the process. For example, if we go back to the histogram that we have seen two slides before, then obviously the input to the programming team is to start working on improving the complexity of those classes, not of the large majority of classes. So the software process to itself is not able to give this kind of insights. However, when we examine the output, the code, by way of doing technical depth analysis on it, we are able to pinpoint to the team what we need to do in order to improve the results. Likewise, a similar relationship exists between the output and the outcome. We see in the practice quite a few examples of teams which produce a lot of code and oftentimes a lot of code of decent quality. However, the outcome from a business perspective is not satisfactory. So what happens, people are working real hard, but they are not working in a way that produces business results. And this is another input that you use in order to improve your process. Namely, yes, we produce a lot of code, but something could be wrong, for example, with respect to the amount of technical debt that we carry, which does not enable the business results to be as good as we would like to. Let me give you an example of how things propagate in the process output outcome slide through the following slide. What you see here is cyclomatic complexity per file on the horizontal axis. So for example, where the marker is right now, the cyclomatic complexity per file is about 50. What you see on the other axis is the probability that a file would be error prone. So if we look, for example, at cyclomatic complexity of 74, the file in which it was diagnosed is 98% guaranteed to be error prone. Conversely, if you go to cyclomatic complexity of 11, the file statistically will be error prone only at 28%. Now, those measurements can be done on an ongoing basis as part of the software process. And if you disregard what they tell you, there will be hell to pay down the road because the cost of fixing a bug in operations is usually two orders of magnitude higher than the cost of fixing it while it is still in the lab. So, you have the predictive power here of cyclomatic complexity, and you have the ability to stop propagation by way of not allowing, let's say, files with cyclomatic complexity over 38 to be deployed or to be part of the release. The release would not come out until the cyclomatic complexity has been taken down to 20 or 15, or ideally you would like it to be 11 or lower. Now, technical depth every so often propagates in spite of all our efforts to stop it, and it really has quite a few uh, bad effects on productivity, and I would just like to mention one aspect of it, which is taken from Jerry Weinberg's book, Quality Software Management. This chart that you see here is really the amount of time that I am able productively to spend on the task as a function of the number of tasks. So if I have one task, obviously, 
I spend 100% of my time on it. However, if I have five tasks, as here, 75% of my time is spent in context switching, getting out of the zone and getting, getting into another zone, and then getting back into the original zone that I was in. And only 25% is left for working on the tasks. So most of my effort is wasted in context switching, and I have got 25 divided by 5, which is equal to 5. Only 5% 5 of my time is available for me to work on my task. And this is quite characteristic of our environments in which the technical depth level is high, because I, as a programmer or a tester, is being hit time and time and time again, but things that I must address because the production line is down or similar problems. So what happens, instead of being able to focus on the next release, devoting 100% of my time to the next release, I get pulled out time and time again to take care of various sins of the past, and as a result, my productivity with respect to my number one task goes down the drain. Now, when you look at it, as Jerry suggests, from a system thinking point of view, you actually realize that there is a vicious cycle which is described in this slide. Let's assume I am the development manager for some project. And of course, there is pressure on me from the business to deliver by a certain date, etc. And with the best intentions in, on earth, I might take some technical debt. Let's say, skip the second hardening iteration that we talked about before, and say, well, I will fix it afterwards. Afterwards being after we released it. The fact of the matter is that oftentimes I do not manage to find the time to pay back the debt. I can't generate the two weeks that are necessary to do the work. Moreover, because I am under a lot of pressure, some of the fixes that I do are work around. I don't have the time to really do a thorough fix which will maintain the structure of the program. Instead, I do something quick and dirty in order to solve the problem right here and now. What this amounts to is that my technical debt arises. When my technical debt arises, inevitably, my productivity goes down because it's a little bit like going in a minefield. When I do some work, I don't know which mines, which metaphorical mines, I will explode. For example, I might be trying to fix one thing and creating another problem. So the velocity goes down. The business, of course, becomes even more anxious and put extra pressure on me to deliver more quickly. I inevitably take more technical depth, and the vicious cycle continues, and it's very, very difficult to break. So the technical depth stuff is not just about how I program in Java. The technical depth stuff has upstream and, up and downstream aspects. Downstream in terms of its manifestations, down the road in production, Upstream, in terms of the way it ties into the business pressures and the business requirements. So, to be able to really address it, you need to have a framework which indicates which aspects must be addressed in order to rein in the technical depth. 
And the Cutter framework has six aspects to it, starting at the very bottom with technical practices and going all the way up to portfolio governance. And as I mentioned earlier, you need to do all six, all six in order to effectively rein in your, your technical debt. Let's start going through those six one by one, starting with technical practices. No uh, surprise here. We are talking about practices that have been known to all of us for 10, 15, maybe even 20 years. The thing, however, is that you need to be systemic in it. For example, refactoring is not something that I do one day a month or do over the weekend when I have a few hours available to me. Refactoring is something that I need to do on an ongoing basis. And in order to have the green light from the business to do it on an ongoing basis, I need to tie up things at the level of product planning and at the level of portfolio governance, which we will speak about in a minute. At the level above the technical practices, we are at the iteration management. Now, the chart that uh, you see here, which is taken from uh, Ken Schwaber's classic Agile Software Development with Scrum, gives us a process view of how the Scrum process works. I have got input here in terms of requirements or stories. I have got the Agile or Scrum code increment every two weeks or so, and this is the output. In between, I have the Scrum process, and I have a control unit, which is a daily Scrum meeting. So every week, uh, I'm sorry, every day at 8.30 a.m. or the like, we meet for 15 minutes, and we do the sync up and redirect the process in terms of what needs to be done between now and tomorrow. So this is classical Scrum, and what we are actually recommending to our clients is to move from classical Scrum into continuous inspection. And what this means is that we drive the process, and it's the same process as we have seen before, not by way of a daily scheduled Scrum meeting, but by way of stopping the line and convening a Scrum meeting whenever we have a technical depth problem. What is a technical depth problem? I did the build and my technical debt went up by $10,000. Or I did the build, and my complexity per class went up by 5%. Or I did the build, and I have got more duplication than I would like to carry with me. So what happens, instead of each time meeting at 8.30, we leave the time of meeting to the events as they are discovered by the technical debt analysis in the code. So instead of meeting today at 8.30 a.m., we might be meeting at 3 p.m. because we did the build and the technical debt results are worrisome. Or maybe we would not be meeting today because the build proves that actually we are making progress on our technical debt. A typical example, which one of my clients is using very, very successfully, is combination of cyclomatic complexity with statistical process control methods. What you see here is a sample of 15 technical debt readings. Namely, we did the analysis once we built once we build the code 15 times. What you see here is the cyclomatic complexity for each of those builds. 
So for example, the cyclomatic complexity here is something like 10.1 or 10.08 or something like that. While obviously the cyclomatic complexity here was found to be pretty close to uh, 10.8, let's say 10.78 or something like that. The average of the various readings is a center line here, and it so happens that it's at 10.058. We draw two standards of deviations line above it, and we draw what's called the upper control limit, which is three standard deviations above it. And we decide when we to stop the scrum process, depending on those results. For example, we may have a policy that if we have a reading of more than two standard deviations than the center line, then we stop the line and call the scrum to discuss what we need to do. Or we may set a policy in supposedly classes that are less important for us, that we will only stop the line when we get a reading which is more than three standard deviations. So statistical process control, together with the stop the line policy, enable us to tailor our response to technical depth events in a way which defeats the kind of application that we are doing. Moving on to project management, here is a typical pattern that we often experience. We start at a time in T0, and the business case indicated a certain amount of net present value. We start working on on developing the code. And of course, our costs grow linearly, one iteration, second iteration, etc. At a certain point in time, T1, we did a technical depth analysis. And we found that actually the value of the technical depth exceeds that of the cost. What this means to us is that basically we are living on margin. Namely, we are not creating equity in the code because we create more debt than useful work. What we typically do under such circumstances is two things. A, we immediately stop the line and focus for the period indicated here as Z1 on doing reduction of technical debt as distinct from additional functional features. In parallel with that, we reduce the estimated net present value for two reasons. A, we don't really know whether we will be able to overcome this amount of technical debt. Second, even if we do, the amount that it takes might force us to deliver less functionality than we planned, and this would typically manifest itself as lower net present value. Now, assuming a favorable uh, state of affairs, we reach the point T2 in which the amount of technical debt is equal to the cost. At that point in time, not all is well, but we have reasons to be more optimistic, namely, the team has shown that it can push down the technical debt. And if you continue in this manner, we have the expectations that we would be able to keep it to a manageable level. So during this period, the Z2 here, we usually split the team 50-50. 50% of the team is devoted to continuing to push down the technical debt and 50% of the team goes down to doing function and features. At a certain point in time, T3, we reach an acceptable level of technical depth. Once this happens, 
we continue to push on the technical depth on an ongoing basis because code is checked in many times a day and with each of uh, the code models being checked in, the technical depth might go higher. So we need to continue to be diligent on keeping the technical depth down and maybe it's not half of the team now working on it, but only 20% of the team working on it. But we continue to refactor in order to keep the technical depth at this level. What is fascinating about this phase, the Z3 phase, is that oftentimes with a low enough level of technical depth, our velocity becomes higher than what was originally assumed. When this is the case, we are able to produce more functional and features than originally planned. And if we have enough runway, we might over-deliver, and as a result, we might actually see higher level of net present value. So the technical depth enables us to manage not only the iterations, but enables us to manage the ongoing project work. Now, at the level about project management, I would put release management. And what you see here is the very same scrum process that we talked about before, the event-driven scrum process on the left side. On the right hand, you have a similar process for IT operations. And what we do, we put in a gate in the transition from development to operations. And the gate may have many attributes to, that needed to be fulfilled in order to pass it, but the most important one is the technical depth. There is an agreement between dev and ops as is what is acceptable in terms of technical depth. And for example, it could be that we shall only deploy code with technical depth density of less than $2 per line of code. Or we would only uh, deploy code with cyclomatic complexity per class less than 15. And it can go on and on with various criteria, technical depth criteria, as to when will the code be deployed. And this simple arrangement has two major benefits. A, if all else fails, you stop the propagation of technical depth at this point in time. Namely, it does not get deployed, if necessary, it gets back to development to rework and reduce the technical depth. Second, it happens every so often with agile teams that the respective velocities in development and the one in IT ops are not similar. Namely, attention is created because devs uh, might be running faster than the change process in IT operations. If you have an agreement about things like technical depth, it works marvels to reduce the tension between the two organizations and to move the discussion from opinions like, oh, it's your miserable code. No, it is your good for nothing operations discipline. Instead of those kind of arguments, you have an adult conversation about is this technical depth appropriate for deployment or is it not? Which, oh, I'm sorry, my apology guys, I did not realize it was an overlay. I thought something was missing. At a higher level, we have the business of product planning and particularly in the sense of what is worthwhile to release or deploy and what is not worthwhile. What you see on the left hand side is a typical iron triangle. I am being held as a development manager 
for schedule, for scope, and for cost. Obviously, those are very, very important. But I would say I could deliver to those three constraints code of poor quality, and I could deliver code which does not really have much business value. So what happens, scope, cost, and schedule are really constraints. They are important, but they are only one of three. I need to be very, very mindful of the quality of the code that I produce, and I need to be very mindful of the value that I produce. And you can make a whole bunch of planning decisions by playing with those three things, value, quality, and constraints. And let's take a look at this example here. If you take a look at the costs, it's one million dollar. The expected final value of the investment is ten million dollar. So on the face of it, we are talking about 900% return on investment, namely 10 minus 1 divided by 1 is 9, which is 900%. And many, company would be, many companies would be quite pleased with this level of debt. Uh, I'm sorry, with this level of return on investment, and they would say ship it. However, assume for a minute that for this product, we have a technical debt level of $2 million. The equation in terms of return on investment changes on us drastically. Yes, the final value would be $10 million, but we need to deduct two and one from it, so we would only have $7 million. And to get the return on investment, we need to divide the two, uh, divide the $7 million by the sum of two, of two and one, which is three. So the rate of return goes down in one fell swoop to 233%. And obviously, the decision whether it's worth as while to deliver this kind of product or to ship this kind of product looks very, very different when you look at 233% instead of 900%. Last but not the least is the business of portfolio governance and our recommendations to our clients is to have technical debt specifically as a strategic allocation. For example, assume I am the R&D manager and I have got those strategic allocations. So I have got something, I think, like 35% devoted to new markets. And I have got something like 30 perhaps devoted to strategic customers. I also have an allocation to technical debt, which in this pie chart is something like 25%. And the importance of this is twofold. A, upfront specific amount of money is dedicated or allocated to reducing technical debt. So I would be able for 25% of my team to work on reducing the technical debt on, the ongoing, on an ongoing basis. Second, this kind of strategic allocations enables us to get into adult conversations. For the better part of my adult life as Vice President of R&D, I would be subject to a dialogue like the following. Israel, if you can only deliver this feature by that date, we close $10 million in account XYZ. And I say I can't really do it. And Vice President of Sales tells me, what's wrong with you, Israel? Don't you want additional $10 million to our revenue stream? And I say something like, well, I really want it, but I don't think I can do it. And usually, depending on the person that I speak with, I hear some snake oil like, oh, Israel, a person like yourself and a team like our team 
could certainly do that. So the discussion becomes a pissing contest. Instead, if Vice President of Sales come to me and says, we have got this $10 million opportunity, I am able to say things, if appropriate, like, look, I have not been spending enough on technical depth because I was following tactical sales opportunities. I actually, this quarter, spent only 90% of my resources instead of 25% of my resources on reducing technical debt. And I am very, very concerned that they would be held to pay if we don't address it. So yes, I would have loved to capitalize on the opportunity you bring to the table, but I simply cannot do it, and here are the numbers to prove it. So instead of the opinion of the Vice President of Sales versus my opinion, it becomes a matter of whether I abide by my allocations or I do not abide by my allocations, which is a much healthier discussion. When you take a look at all those six aspects that we talked about, it leads us into ultimately the question, so how do we rein in technical debt? And I would open it up in a minute to suggestions from the audience, but I would like to prime it with three core, princip three core principles. The first one is a mindset. Software might not literally rust, but it decays. So, software is a compound object. Any compound object over time loses structure. The more it loses structure, the more it decays. And as a result, while you might not physically see rust on your software, you need to think about it as a medium which decays on you. And the decay is reflected in higher and higher levels of technical debt that you need to push down. Second, you need to have the intentionality. Reining in the technical debt is not a cost-free proposition. This is something that folks on your team needs to devote a certain amount of their time to it on an ongoing basis. So maybe 10% or maybe 20% or maybe 30% of their time. But unless you are very, very intentional about refactoring to reduce technical debt being done on an ongoing basis, you will not able to rein it in. Last but not least, you need to be diligent about it through the product life cycle. You need to think about technical debt and plan for it before, after, and during the software development. And you need to do it simultaneously at the six levels that we described in the Cutter Technical Debt Framework. If you do so, our experience is that the prospects of reigning in technical debt are quite good. If you don't, metaphorically, you are likely to end up like those rusty cars, I believe, on the Cross Bronx Expressway in terms of your ability to service your customers, in terms of your ability to respond to change, in terms of ability to adapt the software, and Believe me, this is not a lovely situation to be in when your software decays to this point in time. With that, let me open it up to questions, and I would hope more than questions. I would hope that people in uh, this webinar who will be weighing in with their experiences, their insights, their suggestions, so that all of us can learn from it. Mark, back to you. Yes, thank you very much, Israel. Um, at this point, we're going to move to the Q&A session. To ask a question, just type it in the bar at the bottom of the questions for Israel pod and then click on the speech balloon to the right of that bar. So the first question, Israel, is, is there a rule of thumb for the debt worthiness of code? Should I never accept a technical debt for, say, a dollar amount uh, per thousand lines of code? I would say it is a matter 
of the kind of business that you are in and a matter of your economics. So, for example, if we are talking about uh, reconciliation of transactions on Wall Street, obviously, if your technical debt level is high, you are statistically likely to have stoppage in the operation. Those are, are immensely harmful to your business, to your customers, maybe to the stock exchange. So you really need to be very, very good on keeping down the level of technical debt. On the other hand, if the software on which I uh, write my blog is not as robust as technical, as technical debt on a financial application, this is not the end of the world. So I don't like it if my posts are not available for a couple of minutes. But usually, the economical damage uh, created by it is quite limited. So I would say it's a matter of your application, and it's a matter of your economics. And you decide how strongly you want to push back on the technical debt according to those two. Okay, thank you, Israel. Our next question. In your experience, what are some of the more common sources of resistance or arguments against implementing a technical debt-based approach to development cycles? I would say it's primarily a matter of the software proficiency in an organization. And when I say software proficiency in the organization, I do not mean my ability to code well in Java or in any other language, but it's a matter of the overall system, marketing and sales and customer support, etc., to understand what technical debt is and what it means to the business. If you go back to the three gears that we have been on a little earlier here, technical debt is not about the purity of my code. Technical debt is about my productivity because today's things will affect my productivity tomorrow. And it's about the business outcome because I might spend a fortune to fix a technical debt in the field. So you need to look at it like, let's say, your blood glucose level when you have your annual checkup. You may choose to disregard it, but it would be or it would have consequences down the line. Same here, namely, when we see resistance, it's usually a matter of not being able to comprehend the full picture which is depicted by those three gears. So you have technical debt, it reduces your productivity. It also increases your costs, and your business outcome would be uh, less than desirable. So unless the overall system understands it and builds it into its fabric of processes, you will not be able to have an end-to-end -end technical debt reduction initiative. Okay, thank you, Israel. Our next question, how do you sell technical debt to business? The metaphor to toxic assets like CDOs in your Path to Agility talk some time ago was illuminating. Are there other metaphors that we can use at the executive level? Uh, toxic, uh, toxic codes, I believe, particularly after what we all have done so during 2008 and 2009, is a very apt metaphor, namely, if you go to the analog of living on borrowed money, then some software is precisely of this nature because we borrowed more money, so to speak, than we can pay back. Another metaphor that I often use is that of flossing the teeth. I, uh, if I don't floss my teeth today, no biggie. If I don't floss to the, the teeth tomorrow, again, no biggie. If I don't floss the teeth for a year, then probably
probably I would end up in the dentist chair and have certain level of discomfort, expense, etc. So technical debt to me is of the same nature. Either you refactor and refactor and refactor again on an ongoing basis, or you will metaphorically end in the dentist chair. In addition to the metaphors, what I usually do is quantify the technical debt to the benefit of the broader system. So when we discuss things with folks in the trenches, we could be very, very specific. You have a security violation on line number 77. This is meaningful uh, to the individual programmers. When we discuss it with a CFO or with a CEO, we are really talking about the overall amount of technical debt, let's say $2 million, at what it means in terms of risk. So we take the discussion away from the subtle point of Java, and we put it in terms of dollars and risks. This is something that business people are able to relate to in a very meaningful manner, even if they don't understand the subtleties of the programming language underneath. Great, I think we have time for one more question. Um, Israel, what is the highest level of diplomatic complexity that you measured in an engagement? Well, I think I saw a figure in excess of 2,000, diplomatic uh, complexity of more than 2,000 per class in an engagement that I have done some months ago with uh, Cutter consultant uh, John Hines. John, are you in the audience by any chance? Unfortunately not. I do not remember the very exact figure. Somehow I have the recollection that it was something like 2,200, and both John and I, when uh, we saw it, uh, missed a few heartbeats. And the reason we missed a few heartbeats is the graph that we have looked at a little earlier, namely if your cyclomatic complexity profile is more than, is equal to 74, you have 98% prospects of your file being error prone. Obviously, when your cyclomatic complexity is 2,200, you are guaranteed to have an error prone model. Moreover, it's usually a red flag in terms of the programming discipline in the team. Namely, something is, everyone has some level of technical depth. However, have a technical depth with cyclomatic complexity in the thousands. Something is quite wrong in the way we do things. It might be as simple as poor understanding of the programming language or some other things, but you need to address them it's more than this specific class. It usually indicates some lack of expertise. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Israel. Um, if questions were not answered due to time, we will follow up with those questions after the webinar. On behalf of everyone at Cutter, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. If you have any further questions or comments about the content presented in today's webinar, we encourage you to call or email Israel at igat -I at cutter.com. Please visit cutter.com and go to the events section where you can register for other upcoming webinars and events.